I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, but in there somewhere and all that is a, a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Earlier today, as I was ironing shirts, uh, new shirts that I bought from Target because fall's coming, uh, I thought, well, I'm going to record a podcast secretly, privately, down here in my basement while one of my children is sleeping and the other one's at work, um, which is why I didn't put out an episode on Thursday, as if anyone's paying attention, uh, just because uh, the kids are in the way. I have to keep running them around and doing stuff with them. Their mom decided to go camping. Uh all week until the 20th and so I have the kids which is normally fine but when you want to do things uh, like grown up stuff like podcasts things that kids sneer at while they look up at you with disgust from their TikTok then uh, yeah I have to suddenly squeeze it in so I have to squeeze in two episodes just so I can be set for the week so God knows I won't be able to do it later and uh, they're really putting a, a dent in my sad little life But, uh, in other news, I was ironing a shirt, and I decided, uh, I'll listen to an old episode of, uh, Leaves of Glen to kind of see what my vibe was, and if I can recreate it so I don't sit here sounding all depressed and whatever. And, oh boy, I listened to the death of, uh, Koshi, and then something else a little while back, or further back, before COVID kicked in. And, oh man, did I have a life. I'd have stories in the beginning to tell, and I was all excited as I was reading, But after the six months of not having an exciting life to live and uh, more or less just being around the house for the most part, uh, I sound more deflated. So I think think COVID is ruining the show uh, for my five listeners. But I apologize to you for that. So uh, here you're going to hear a lot of uh, forced good times because, damn it, I'm going to bring back the old Glenn. Uh, So with that... uh, Let's try not to think about the wildfires going on in California and Oregon. Uh, I reached out to Serena Dory, uh, an author whose stories I've read, uh, as payment for letting me read one of her stories on this show. I recorded an audiobook of her work for her. And recently she sent out an email uh, saying, you can go listen to this audiobook and download the the ebook and whatever else you want to do. And and I was like, oh, look at that. There's my name. And uh, there's me reading it. Oh, that's so weird. Uh, an audiobook that uh, has my voice. So I'll put that in the show notes. But I reached out saying, hey, I saw the mass email you sent out. Uh, pretty cool seeing me uh, as reading your audiobook. And she wrote back saying, uh, I hope you're doing well. There's fires everywhere. And I'm looking to be evacuated any minute. And she said, I don't know where you live, but I hope things are going for you. And then I felt really guilty. Because uh, I'm in Minneapolis, where besides uh, uh, the protests and, and the rioting that happened around George Floyd, not a lot's been going on here, except for disease. Uh, she's got wildfires that might chase her from her home. So now I just feel guilty and uh, resentful at the year 2020 being both the shortest and longest years on the face of the earth. Uh, well, with that, let's dive into our next story. This week, we're going to read Her Lover by Maxim Gorky. I would do a little bit about the author, but we already talked about him in the last episode. Uh, Kind of a revolutionary in Russia. Uh, He traveled a lot and wrote about stuff he experienced. Uh, Pretty straightforward stuff. So, with that, uh, let's dive into the story. Her Lover by Maxim Gorky. Uh, 
An acquaintance of mine uh, once told me the uh, following story. Uh, when I was a student in Moscow, I happened to live alongside one of those ladies whose repute is questionable. Ah, she was a Pole. Uh, uh, they called her Teresa. <laughs> she was a Pole, <laughs> like Polish? That's horrible. <laughs> Oh, good. Xenophobia already within the first paragraph. Uh, she was a tallish, powerfully built brunette <laughs> with black bushy eyebrows and a large cor- coarse face as if carved out by a hatchet. Jesus. The bestial gleam of her dark eyes, her thick bass voice, her cabman-like gait, and her immense uh, muscular vigor, worthy of a fishwife, inspired me with horror. Oh, I lived on the top flight. Of her, of her garret was opposite to mine. I never left my door open uh, when I knew her to be at home. Uh, but this, after all, was a very rare occurrence. Sometimes I chanced to meet her on the staircase or in the yard. And she would smile upon me with a smile which seemed to me to be sly ah, and cynical. Occasionally, uh, I saw her drunk with bleary eyes and tousled hair and a particularly uh, hideous grin. On such occasions, she would speak to me, uh, how do ye do, Mr. Student? And her stupid laugh would still further intensify my loathing of her. I could have liked to have changed my quarters in order to have avoided such encounters and greetings, but my little chamber was a nice one, ah, and there was such a wide view from the window. And it was always so quiet in the street below, so I endured. One morning, uh, I was sprawling on my couch, uh, trying to find some sort of excuse for not attending class, when the door opened, and the bass voice of Teresa, the loathsome, resounded from my threshold. Uh, Good health to you, Mr. Student. Uh, What do you want? I said. I saw that her face was confused and supplicatory. (laughs) It was a very unusual sort of face for her. Sir, I want to beg a favor of you. Uh, Will you grant it me? I lay there silent and thought to myself, ah, gracious, courage, my boy. I want to send a letter home. Yeah, that's what it is, she said, her voice beseeching, soft and timid. Deuce take you, I thought, but up I jumped and sat down on my table and took a sheet of paper and said, eh, come here, sit down and dictate. Oh, she came. She sat down very gingerly on a chair and she looked at me with a guilty look. Well, uh, who, who do you want to write? To Boleslav Kashput, at the town of Svispania, on the Warsaw Road. Oh, a fire away. My dear Bulls, my darling, my faithful lover, may the Mother of God uh, protect thee, thou heart of gold. Why hast thou not ridden for such a long time to thy souring little dove, Teresa? I nearly burst out laughing. A souring little dove? Yeah, more than five feet high, with fists of stone and more in weight, and, and a, a black a face, as if the little dove had lived all her life in a chimney. I never had once washed itself, restraining myself. Somehow, I asked, Eh, hey, who's Bolst? Bowles, Mr. Student, she said, as if offended with me for blundering over the name. He's Bowles, my young man. A uh, young man? Why are you so surprised, sir? Can I, a girl, not have a young man? She, a girl, oh, well. <laughs> oh, why not, I said. All things are possible. And uh, has he been, that's mean, <laughs> has been your young man long? Oh, six years. Oh, ho, oh, I thought. Well, let us write your letter. And I tell you plainly uh, what I would willingly have changed places with this Bowles if his fair correspondent had not uh, Teresa, but something less than she. Uh, I thank you most heartily, sir, for your kind services, sir, Teresa, to me, with a curtsy. Perhaps I uh, can show you uh, some service, eh? Uh, no. I most humbly thank you all the same. Yeah, uh, perhaps, sir. Uh, your shirts, <laughs> or, your, or your trousers, my one, a little mending. I felt that this mastodon in petticoats uh, uh, made me grow quite red with shame, and I told her pretty sharply that I had no need whatsoever for her services. She departed. A week or two passed away, and it was evening. I was sitting at my window, whistling, (laughs) and thinking of some expedient for enabling me to get away from myself. I I was bored. Uh, The weather was dirty. What's dirty weather like? I didn't want to go out. And uh, out of sheer ennui, uh, oh, ennui, I've learned the right pronunciation for that, uh, began a course of self-analysis and reflection. 
This also was dull enough work that I didn't care about doing anything else. Yeah, then the door opened. Heaven be praised. Yeah, someone came in. Oh, Mr. Student, you have no pressing business, I hope. That was Teresa. Ugh. No, what is it? I was going to ask you, sir, to, to write me another letter. Very well, to Bowles, eh? No, this time it's from him. What? Stupid that I am. It is not for me, Mr. Student, I beg your pardon. It is for a friend of mine, that is to say, not a friend, but an acquaintance, a man acquaintance. He has a sweetheart, uh, just like me here, Teresa. Uh, that's how it is. Will you, sir, uh, write a letter to this Teresa? I looked at her. Her face was troubled. Her fingers were trembling. I was a bit fogged at first, and then I guessed at how it was. Uh, look here, uh, my lady, I said. There are no bullses or Teresas at all, and you've been telling me a pack of lies. Don't you come sneaking about me uh, any longer. I have no wish whatsoever to cultivate your acquaintance. Uh, do you understand? And suddenly, she grew strangely terrified and distraught. Uh, she began to shift from foot to foot without moving from the place, and spluttered uh, comically, as if she wanted to say something she could. I waited to see what would come of all this, and I saw and felt that apparently I had made a great mistake in suspecting her of wishing to draw me from the path of righteousness. It was evidently something very different. Mr. Student, she began, and suddenly waving her hand, and turned abruptly toward the door and went out. I remained with a very unpleasant feeling in my mind. I listened. Her door flung violently to. Uh, plainly the door, Wrench was very angry, and I thought it over and resolved to go to her and, inviting her to come in here, write everything she wanted. I entered her apartment. I looked around. She was sitting at a table, leaning on her elbows, with her head in her hands. Listen to me, I said. Now, whenever I come to this point in my story, I always feel horribly awkward and idiotic. Well, well, listen to me, I said. She leapt from her seat. I came toward me with flashing eyes, and laying her hands on my shoulders, began to whisper, or rather to hum, in her peculiar bass voice, uh, Look you now, it's like this. There's no bowls at all, and there is no Teresa either. But what's that to you? Is it a hard thing for you to draw your pen over paper? Eh? Ah, and you, too. Still such a little fair-haired boy. There's nobody at all, neither bowls nor Teresa, only me. And there you have it, and much good it may do you. Yeah, pardon me, said I, altogether flabbergasted by such reception. Eh, what is this all about? There's no bowls, you say? No, so it is. And no Teresa either? And no Teresa, I'm Teresa. I don't understand it at all. I fixed my eyes upon her and tried to make out which of us was taking leave of his or her sense, uh, senses. Uh, but she went again to the table, searched about for something, and came back to me and said in an offended tone, if it was so hard for you to write to Bowles, look, there's your letter. Take it. Others will write for me. I looked. Uh, in her hand was my letter to Bowles. Phew. <laughs> Phew. I don't know how to pronounce that, really. Phew, I guess, maybe is how you're supposed to do that. Listen, uh, Teresa, uh, what's the meaning of all this? Why must you get others to write for you when I have already written it and, and you haven't sent it? Uh, sent it where? Why did this uh, Bowles... Yeah, there is no such person. I absolutely did not understand it. Uh, there was nothing for me uh, but to spit and go. Does that, what do you like, spit at her feet? She explained. What is it? She said, still offended. Yeah, there's no such person, I tell you. And she extended her arms as if she herself did not understand why there should be no such person. Yeah, but I wanted him to be. Am I then not a human creature like the rest of them? Yes, yes, I know, I know, of course. Yet no harm has been done to anyone by my writing him, so I can see. Pardon me, uh, to whom? Uh, to Bowles, of course. But he doesn't exist. Alas, alas. But what if he doesn't? He doesn't exist, but he might. Oh, I write to him, and it looks as if he did exist. And, and Teresa, that's me, <laughs> and he replies to me, and then I write to him again. I understood at last, and I felt so sick, so miserable, so ashamed somehow. Alongside of me, not three yards away, lived a human creature who had nobody in the world to treat her kindly, affectionately. And this human being had invented a friend for herself. Look now, you wrote me a letter to Bowles, and I gave it to someone else to read it to me. 
and when they read it to me, I listened and fancied that Bowles was there. And I asked you to write me a letter from Bowles to Teresa, uh, that is to me, and then they write such a letter for me and read it to me. Oh, I feel quite sure that Bowles is there, and life grows easier for me in consequence. Deuce take you for a blockhead, said I to myself when I heard this. From thenceforth, eh, regularly, twice a week, I wrote a letter to Bowles, and an answer from Bowles to Teresa. I wrote those answers, eh, well, she of course listened to them, and wept like anything, roared, and I would say, eh, with her bass voice, and in return, eh, for my thus moving her to tears by real letters from the imaginary Bowles, she began to mend the holes I had in my socks, eh, shirts, and other articles of clothing. Subsequently, about three months after this history began, they put her in prison uh, for something or another. Uh, no doubt by this time she's dead. <laughs> God! <laughs> well, that's just sad all over. My acquaintance shook the ash from a cigarette, uh, looked pensively up at the sky, and thus concluded, Well, well, the more a human creature has tasted of bitter things, the more it hungers after the sweet things of life. And we, wrapped round in the rags of our virtues and regarding others, though the mist, through the mist, of our self-sufficiency and persuaded of our universal impeccability, do not understand this. And the whole thing turns out pretty stupidly, and uh, very cruelly. The fallen uh, classes, we say. And who are the fallen classes? I would like to know. They are, first of all, people with the same bones, flesh, and blood, and nerves as ourselves, and have been told uh, this day after day for ages, and we actually listen, and the devil only knows how hideous the whole thing is. Or are we completely depraved uh, by the loud sermonizing of humanism? In reality, we are also uh, our fallen folks, and as far as I can see, very deeply fallen from the abyss of self-sufficiency and the conviction of our own superiority. But enough of this. is like just a big old lesson at the end. But enough of this. Uh, it is all as old as the hills. And so it is a shame to speak of it. Very old indeed. Yes, that's what it is. Well, that was short and weird. Uh, I guess as an author, if you can't figure out how to wrap up a story, you can... Just end it by saying, and then they went to jail for some reason or another is probably dead by now. And apparently that counts as, uh, as fine writing. And then you follow it up with a big old lecture about how things are unfair to humans. How do I tie this in uh, with what I said earlier? Uh, I can't think of anything. Uh, I complained about how I feel guilty that living in Minneapolis isn't nearly as dangerous as it is living in uh, Oregon. Uh, and how a selfishly a disease a pandemic has ruined the quality of my show. So, uh, selfishness? Self-importance? Uh, you're going to be a jerk about uh, a person who's lonely and wants to interact with you, and then you make the effort to satisfy them, and then they go to prison, and you don't care to find out why, and you definitely don't go visit them. Or there's no lessons learned here at all. There's no lesson and human compassion, even if you give a big speech at the end about how we're all the same with our nerves and our bones, uh, you'll think that to yourself uh, in your room and how it's as old as the hills. Uh, everyone is the same, and yet we have different classes. That's just tacked out at the end. And then it's, uh, oh, isn't that weird? And never bother to check up on her. No lessons. Are so I guess that's uh, what we learned today, that no lessons are ever learned. I can't fake more happy and exciting because I don't have an exciting life. So this show just gets more morose. Uh, one show that isn't morose, my niece uh, has decided to give up on the Harry Potter podcast that she does with her friends. And now it's just, uh, it's just a show that they do called Besties, where they just sit and talk, which is pretty cute. I listened to it. and It was pretty enjoyable. Uh, and they talked a lot about a video game for the Nintendo Switch called Animal Crossing, which... As exciting as my life is now, I just play Animal Crossing all the time. I've been doing it like crazy. Oh, I run around doing little jobs and improving my house, and, and I actually care about it. I tried playing this game when it first came out because my daughters were all excited, but then the game was kind of boring, and they dropped off, and then I uh, played for like two seconds. I'm like, yeah, this is boring. But now suddenly, uh, with life being the way it is, 
I suddenly care more about this game than I care about my career. Uh, so, that's kind of sad. But you should listen to my niece's podcast. Yeah, I've run out of things to say. Well, I guess I'm going to do another follow-up episode so that I don't have to try and squeeze it in later when I deal with my kids. So, uh, with that, thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you soon.